Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Erin Bowe, who is a children's book author, and Erin, uh, uh, she's also an award-winning uh, children's book author. So Erin, I'm going to let you tell people what it is that you really write. What I really write? What you uh -huh. really write. I write a whole bunch of things, but today I'm here with my children's author hat on. Um, I write mostly middle grade and young adult books. And my most recent is a middle grade called Simon Sort of Says, uh, which is for genuinely middle grade students, uh, sixth, seventh, eighth graders. Um, and it's about a boy named Simon O'Keefe who moves to a town where there is no internet uh, because there's a giant radio telescope and the scientists can't have things that clutter up their search for alien life so there's no cell phones or wi-fi and for most teenagers that would be a deal breaker but simon is very happy about it because simon is famous for the worst thing that ever happened to him so freed and from anybody being able to google him he starts spinning stories so it's a comedy but it's a comedy about recovering from trauma. And uh, it just won a Newbery honor. <laughs> it's like, I can't even pretend not to be just super overwhelming. <laughs> Congratulations on that. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? I really like writing for young people. Um, and I know that there are lots of adults, including me, who like to read um, books for middle graders and books for young adults. And I think one of the things that's really refreshing about them is, well, there are two things. First, kids are a great quality control system because kids won't read something if there's no story to it. So I read a lot of literary fiction. I love literary fiction. I read widely. Um, but every once in a while you get to the end of a novel by someone who has a Nobel Prize. Like I just read a Coetzee and you're like, that was so lovely. And I'm not sure what the point of it was. <laughs> but children will never put up with something that, that doesn't have a story in it because someone made them read The Mill on the Floss and there's just no looking back after that. <laughs> um, <laughs> the other thing that I really like about writing for children is there are Emotions are really honest and big. Like we say that teenagers are dramatic and we mean it as an insult, you know, or at least a complaint. Oh God, they're so dramatic. And you know, I have two in the house over there. So I understand that complaint, but it's not a falseness, right? For them, it's like weddings and funerals every day. So the emotional stakes of things tend to be high and tend to be clear and they have their hearts out on their sleeves and I just, I love that about them as young people. And I love writing for them in a way that honors that. Uh -huh. All right. Very good. So what was the inspiration for Simon Sort of Says? Ooh. Okay. So let me give you a little backstory. I haven't always been a writer. I'm, I'm trained as a particle physicist. Uh -huh. you know, obvious crossover skill there, right? So mm, those are yeah. the people who like crash two things together to create this spectacular and instructive mess. And then through close study of that mess, learn how to, you know, more about how the universe is put together, more about how matter and forces work. And I often find as a writer that I think I have an idea, but it's not working until I hit it full speed with another idea kind of accidentally. Um, so Simon sort of says started as kind of a target idea of I always wanted to write a comedy and I set my comedy in a funeral home because that's the kind of person that I am. Um, and but it wouldn't quite come together and it was sort of on not just on the back burner but like on the back burner of the stove in the hallway in the apartment down the hall you know it just would not go and then one day um, I read a long form article about the National Quiet Zone, which is a real place. It's in Virginia, although I moved mine to Grin and Barrett, Nebraska, because I'm from Nebraska and I wanted to set a story there. Um, and I thought, what kind of kid would move to the quiet zone and be happy about it? 
you know, what kind of what kind of family might relocate themselves to a place with no internet and what does that mean? And so those two ideas kind of crash together, the idea of the comedy and the idea of the quiet zone. And then at the same time, um, the same week I read about the National Quiet Zone, um, my children, my they were grade school at the time, um, but they're teenagers now, um, were in this big scary lockdown at their school. They were hiding in a supply closet for four hours. And so the idea of um, someone who has trauma and like viral fame related to that kind of violence in the schools um, sort of informed that. So three things kind of crashing together at the same time. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what kind of research went into uh, Simon Sorta Says? Um, should I spoil it? Should I, t I guess I sort of just did. Um, so the thing that Simon really? is, is famous for, the thing that follows his, uh, that he's haunted by is that Simon is the survivor of this school shooting. This book was actually announced, um, the book deal was announced the same day as the Uvalde shooting, which is oh, a little bit too close to home. Um, you know, so an event like that, something that really captured the public imagination. And so that's the hardest piece of research is to do justice to survivors, especially survivors. You know, when I'm writing about a story about fame and many of these survivors have become famous and they don't like that and who can blame them? Mm. So to to do justice to what their real experience is without exploiting them is the hardest part so um i talked to a couple and i read everything i could get my hands on um there's you know the parkland kids put out a book called parkland mm -hmm. speaks which is excellent um vice did a series has a long-standing series of essays and interviews with um school shooting survivors which was very useful and then I talked to a number of people specializing in trauma and children, not survivors themselves, but like people to work with, with traumatized kids. So that was the biggest piece of research. Um, wow. Yeah. I'm making it sound so serious though. This is a book that like starts with alpacas in a church going completely off the wire. So it's, <laughs> it's a, it's, it's genuinely a funny book. It's just also a book of, about healing from trauma. Weddings and that, funerals, right? Weddings and funerals for kids every day. Right, mm -hmm. right. That that must have been really tough to try and combine the two. It's a real um, tightrope. Yeah. 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 How how did you manage to do that with combine the two? Um, you know, okay. Um, my, when I talk to children, when I talk to my my primary audience, I don't use this metaphor because they don't understand it, but I think you're going to. I grew up watching MASH. Okay. Okay. So MASH is a comedy about, it's not even about a war. It's about healing from a war, literally healing from a war. And it was a smash hit uh, during and in the immediate aftermath of a war, right? Mm -hmm. It was yep. filmed. Um, in, it was a smash hit in the 70s when the United States was coming out of Vietnam and then immediately after that. And our best way to have a national conversation was through comedy. And I guess I sort of imprinted on that. Um, so yeah, it's there's a tightrope. There's, there's, um, there's an edge to it, but there's also kind of a naturalness to it because you need something... Like funny isn't funny isn't a story, right? Funny Correct. is an approach, um, and there has to be something fueling it. And usually, when you when I poke at it, what's fueling it is like its anger turned upside down, or its desperation turned sideways or inside out. And you know, as a parent of of kids who've been in lockdowns, and you know, watching this generation grow up like this, you know, it's. Yeah, it's I was angry and desperate and I know my kids are and I am really anxious to turn that upside down. So I find that actually it the one fuels the other 
as opposed to being quite as contradictory as they look on the surface. Wow, that is really amazing. Well, so here's how I put it when I talk to actual children, because they don't get the mash thing. You know what's funnier yeah. than farting? Farting at funerals is funnier than farting. <laughs> right? So it's the it's the tension and the transgression and the high stakes of the background breaking mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. like the bit where the emus escape the emu farm. Right? Yes, I understand that now. It, it's mm -hmm. great to to get an idea of, of how you can put funny into a or into a serious situation what, what you just said about farting in funerals mm -hmm. just just put something that's totally opposite in a way uh, not opposite but totally um never done in in a yeah. certain situation mm -hmm. or, or totally something that would would um make people laugh Mm -hmm. in a certain situation I, I think that's wonderful that's a great idea and for other writers I think it would it would certainly help them out mm -hmm. to, to give them that idea yeah that high tension moment yeah is, you know if you've ever had the giggles at an inappropriate moment for the giggles which I think most of us have because it's a very human thing like to like take this high emotion thing and then suddenly it just flips upside down and it's it's very releasing and it's very healing and sometimes very embarrassing. <laughs> but um, you know, it's there's something really good about it. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So what was your what was your favorite research story that you've ever had in all of your books that you've written? Oh, I know you've book. written you've written several. I have. This uh, Simon sort of says is novel number six. So yeah, mm -hmm. novel number five. Ooh, novel number five is Stand on the Sky, which is about a girl learning to hunt with eagles in Mongolia. So to um to write that, I um I actually went and lived for the summer in Mongolia with Kazakh nomads. So all of my favorite research stories are Aaron attempts to be a Kazakh nomad. And they're mostly stories that I'm going to tell at my own expense, like the time I tried to milk the male goat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that was that was the biggest research adventure I've ever had. That was fantastic, life changingly interesting and good. And you know, there's something very grounding about being, you know, like an accomplished person who's kind of maxed out the points in our system and then you drop you in another system and you're like oh man i'm an idiot i can't do like these people like look at you and like oh these people are going to starve when the cold weather comes they can't milk anything they have no skills like they put you to work milking and you can't milk things and uh they're like okay let's give them the task that we give the five-year-olds it's like could you go gather some yak dung for the fire and then you know you wouldn't think it would be possible to screw that up but you would be wrong <laughs> <laughs> so yeah oh that's great that sounds like a wonderful trip <laughs> it was it was so okay so getting back to uh simon sort of says Mm -hmm. uh, what was the biggest challenge that you had in, in writing and putting out, Simon sort of says? Um, the biggest challenge, for me, it's always plot is the biggest writing challenge. I, um, I find I have, like, inspiration from a story comes to me in this burst of light and collision and takes off and mm -hmm. I can't. I mean that's just a gift. I don't I don't know where it comes from exactly, but when you when it hits, you can feel it. Um, and I'm really good at characters. Characters kind of walk onto the name with a, walk onto the page with a name and start talking. And I'm good at hearing their voices, and they they kind of come to life for me. But I can't plot my way out of a paper bag. Um, my husband's also a novelist, and he just kind of like dumps the ideas. Um, components of his plot onto a table like a set of tinker toys and starts putting it together he has it all plotted out before he can even start to write and I'm like I, I don't know how you're doing that that's just even having lived with him for 25 years I don't know how he does that 
Um, and so my biggest challenge in writing this was, was keeping the plot balanced, um, keeping it from being like the first half of the book, which is what has happened to Simon? And the second half of the book, or, can they fake a message from space aliens? Uh, which is sort of the plot that gets going in the book. Um, so to weave those together and give it a whole, so it doesn't feel like it's over halfway through, that doesn't feel like there's a switch so that all of the characters have an arc um, and all of the arcs land at the same time. That was really hard. My editor, Rachel Stark at uh, Disney, they're a genius. Uh, they really helped me put it together. Uh-huh. So it sounds like you're a pantser rather than an outliner. I'm afraid so. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have heard it described another way that I think is useful. Like there are writers who are inductive and writers who are deductive, like Sherlock Holmes. So you've got the writers who like put a scene into place and then imagine all the details that you need to bring that scene to life. And then there are writers, and I'm one of them, who are like sniffing along going, oh, and they you write something and there's a new detail, and then that suggests the next scene. And so that's mm -hmm. how my brain works, is like the each detail or character moment sort of suggests something new and fills in the world around it. And so, so the characters don't really, the, the characters don't really tell you kind of what's going to happen next or they don't they don't kind of no, I kind of need to follow them around it's a very inefficient process I will admit that I'll, but uh revision is your chance to make it look like you did it all on purpose and knew it all along so I think you do <laughs> yes works pretty well you do a but, lot of revisions. Uh, if I get one more Facebook ad for outlining my novel in a day I'm gonna have to throw this laptop across the room like a frisbee <laughs> does, does not work think for everyone <laughs> does not work for me yeah, I I I don't think there's any way I could do that either. It must work for somebody. It must. Um, we're all yeah, different, so. right? We're yeah. all different. Like I have a pair of intricately plotted science fiction political thrillers that I'm like, I don't know. There's robots, there's horses. It's kind of and by the end of it, people are like, ah, oh, so twisty, I didn't see that coming. I'm like, good news, neither did I. Okay. Okay. So um what character did you love or hate the most when you were writing this book? Oh, I'm in love with Agate. Um Okay. So Simon has a best friend named Agate Vanderswan who walks onto the page in like chapter four and sits down across the across from Simon at lunch and says, What is the most disgusting thing you know? It's kind of an audition you know, because she's really into disgusting things. She's like, there are spider mites adapted to live only on human eyelashes. Simon, of course, being the son of an undertaker, knows many disgusting things, so they become fast friends. Um, and she's, Agate is only in there sort of because um, I needed someone who thought it was a really good idea to fake a message from space aliens to make the plot go. It's always useful as a writer to have someone who's willing to kick over the blocks and do something outrageous. So my characters tend to be very careful and cautious, my lead characters. So you need someone else. Um, but she was meant to be a placeholder. She was such a placeholder character that I gave her the name of my daughter's cat, Agate. And when Agate the cat, Agate the cat was like the neighbor's cat had kittens. And then the neighbor's cat abandoned the kittens and they like raised them by hand in the bathtub with bottles. Of, um, so we got Agate. Um, much younger than you would ordinarily want to get a kitten. Um, and we brought her into the house, just this little scrap of things with this big old tomcat who's like, and this very dumb, very large hound who's like, oh, I think that's new. Is that new? Is it new? Is it, I, 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 that's new, right? And so the kitten freaked out and hid under the bed for like three hours. But when she came out, she was ready to take over our house. It's just like, hey, I'll be in charge of all the plot now. Just get used to it. I'm in charge. So Agatha the character is very like that. She's okay, completely comfortable and confident in who she is the way a cat is. Just kind of like, hey. 
and you know she's an autistic character which um I've, i'm hungry as like a neurodiverse person and my children as autistic kids are just hungry for that kind of like an autistic character on the page who like her autism isn't a source of trauma and it isn't a problem to be solved it's just who she is and you know it affects how she interacts certainly but um you know she's just out there neurodiversing her best neurodiverse life which includes in this case faking a message from space aliens with the new kid in town <laughs> Okay. Now, how did you determine what point of view you wanted to to make this uh, book in? You know what? That's not really a decision for me because characters come to me. And when they walk onto the page, they usually come with a voice. And so I start writing and um, it's in first person or it's in third person. And it's from the point of view that it's 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 right there so it doesn't feel like a decision that i make i did go back and forth and back and forth over present versus past tense to be honest i don't even remember where i landed past i think because continuous present kind of bugs me a little bit but mm -hmm. yeah it's that was that was the only uh that was the only like big autistic artistic decision was was the tense um for me, that's not one of the things I make choices about. It's part of what I call the original equipment of a novel. Like the part that's just mm -hmm. kind of given to you. You're like, oh, okay. It's something more than a premise, something less than a plot and a handful of characters. And then you just uh -huh. kind of set them loose and see what they do. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Great. And um, okay. That, so what else can we expect from you in the future? In the future? Um, I'm just writing a, a couple of books for a little bit younger readers, like six, seven, eight. Um, mm -hmm. they're talking animal books, um, where the animals take a road trip, but the, the story in the road trip is stolen from the Odyssey, which I, I like very much. <laughs> I love it. So it's a chance yeah. to get my, my, um, my, uh, classical, uh, angst and and fun out on the page so those those are just delightful books i i spent a year writing just delightful ones after writing um simon sort of says which is funny but also as you can imagine kind of um an interesting mental space to spend time with with kids in trauma and healing from trauma um so yeah the talking cat doesn't have a lot of trauma <laughs> Uh, I'm writing a science fiction novel for grown-ups that I don't know quite where it's going to go. Um, you know, I sort of put it down because it's, you know, too much trauma. And then I also write poetry. I write poetry under my maiden name. Look, show and tell. I write poetry under my maiden name, which is Erin Noteboom. Uh, this is the latest. This is a knife so sharp its edge cannot be seen, um, which is a book of poetry about science. Uh, and I'm sort of writing another book of poetry about science. This one's sort of about Marie Curie and mm. um, radiation physics. And the next one's kind of the Anthropocene, the idea of the changing world, the idea that we've changed the world and how things change. Um, so I've been out talking to people who are like experts in moss. I'm like, please tell me how moss changes. <laughs> so that's been a really interesting project um but that might be a few poetry is very slow for me um so that might be a few more years hmm. mm -hmm. okay um now i have questions about being a writer okay what what is your favorite part about being a writer on the whole writing and publishing process um there's one at each end i really like days when you sit down and create something out of nothing and just this sort of like this flow state that I think everybody is familiar with where you're just like oh that's magic um they're relatively rare I and mean, if you if you write by sitting around and waiting for them it really genuinely is going to take you a long time to get through a whole novel uh so there are days when writing is not like that but when it is like that that's maybe the best thing ever um 
The other thing I really like is way at the other end, when I write for young people, I love talking to young people afterwards. So I do a lot of school visits. And some of them are like, you know, they slap you up at the front of the gym and, and the kids don't know who you are or why you're there. And, and, you know, some of that can be hard. But there's always a kid or two who's like, who's read the book and thought it was magic or who, who is seeing an author in person for the first time and somehow going, oh, wait, those are human beings. Books are written by like ordinary people. I could be an ordinary person. <laughs> uh, I never met an author growing up. It didn't occur to me that um, I might write books. And every once in a while, you can just see this magic click of like, I write now and I could keep writing and I could create something and I could add my voice to the world. So there's sort of one on either end. Yeah. It would be a wonderful feeling to have kids mm -hmm. who've read your books. It I'm really is. It really is. It's great to talk to adults too, but kids are so kids are so much more honest than adults would be. Um, you know, I, I got a letter for my very first book called Plain Kate. One of the first pieces of fan mail I ever got was from some kid who introduced himself as like a homeschooled 11 year old who told me that he'd bought my book to like read in the bathroom but found it so good that he had to take it out of the bathroom to finish chapters because he wasn't in the bathroom for the whole length of a chapter. And I'm like, okay, quit while I've peaked. <laughs> and you, you won, you won. You won. <laughs> so you gotta love that, right? You gotta love <laughs> young people who read your books and tell you just exactly what their experience was um, in a way that a grown up <laughs> never would. And it's just, yeah, I love them. <laughs> and he loved your book and he loved my book <laughs> oh that's great mm -hmm. so what do you consider the, the most challenging part of the writing process on the whole uh and how do you overcome that um i mean there are pieces of publishing that are hard on i think any author and they tend to vary from book to book and house to house and with the whims of the marketplace. Um, if anyone's ever sold a house, you know, that sort of like high stakes, but it's totally out of your control, but also it's very personal because it's your house. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff like that in publishing. Um, and my strategy for that is to sort of keep my head down and write the next book. Um, there's not a lot else one can do. As in the actual writing process, um, the hardest thing to do is is mostly to keep going, you know, because there are wonderful days that are flow state days where you just make magical words. Um, maybe one writing day in 10 is like that. And the other nine are like, what am I doing here? <laughs> um, and sometimes it's very frustrating. And my trick for that, this is going to sound so dumb. <laughs> my trick for that is I give myself stickers. Okay. I have actual physical stickers. They're little shiny star stickers. And I put them on the calendar when I, it depends on what I'm doing. Right now I'm drafting. So I put a sticker on my calendar when I write 500 words. Later it might be like when I've edited a chapter, but right now I'm drafting. And I look at the sticker and I'm like, I wrote 500 words, I get a sticker, which gives me that little dopamine hit. And it also kind of keeps me rolling. It's like, I wrote 300 words, but if I wrote 200 more words, which is not that many words, I could have a sticker. Um, and then you get, you put it on a calendar and it's up on the wall and you're like, oh, look at all those stickers. And on days that are just terrible, and there are a few, when you try to write and just, Sherlock Holmes is like, you hook the battery to a non-conductor. It just drains, you know, it's just, it's, mm -hmm. it's heat without light. It's just this useless feeling. Uh, and your brain is like, oh God, I'm broken. It feels like I have felt like this forever and shall feel like this forever more. I put an X on those days because when I look at the calendar, I'm like, there's really only one X, mm -hmm. right? When I look back on January, I'm like, oh, there are really only two Xs. It's okay. 
your brain just lies to you about that. Um, so yeah, stickers. I have converted many an author to uh, to the system of put stickers on a chart. Uh, and it it sounds so stupid but it really does work for me that's clever that's a clever idea mm -hmm. it does kind of give you a a little push a little punch and you know it's laying down a book is like laying down a piece of sandstone it's one little micro critter falling to the sea floor at a time and it feels it feels really long but if it's if you give yourself a sticker for say 500 words then two stickers is a thousand words and 50,000 words is a short book. So, you know, that's only a uh, hundred stickers. That doesn't seem like that many. Hmm. Right. It's that's true. That crazy. Hmm. Yeah. 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 So, um, a, a question that I, that I neglected to ask you before, um, do you do most of your editing or do you have an editor help you? And you said for, for, uh, um, for Simon says, uh, Simon sort of says, uh, you said that you had some editors from Disney help. Yeah, yeah. So it's published by Disney and I have an editor at Disney. Um, I think there's no gift to a writer like a really good editor. Um, I do, and I think most writers do a, a big amount of self-editing. Like the first draft that I put down in a mess and I wouldn't want to share it with anyone except, you know, a handful of close writer friends and and my hubby in there um who are like look I made a mess but it's a finished mess and then they have thoughts and can kind of cheer you along so there's a couple of steps of self-editing and then my agent tends to be very hands-on with editing not all agents are and you know it, it sort of depends on their strengths and what you want as a writer um, but my agent is, so we usually go a round or two to get it ready to sell. Um, and then you sell it and you acquire a brand new editor. And by that point, it's usually draft four. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then you go two or three more rounds with them. So, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's something I often tell to young people. And when you're sitting in a class, when you're sitting in a gym, you can see the teachers going, see, see, I told you revision is important. Revision is important, kids. Look at that stack of drafts. I told you revision was important. And you can see the kids kind of going, oh my God, that's a stack. I mean, they're a little um, skittish about it um, because it genuinely is when you pull it out and it's a stack, it's a stack like this because um, I do everything on paper. And, but the important and useful thing to know for young writers mm -hmm is you acquire this taste, you acquire this feeling of what magic looks like on the page. And when you're looking at that magic on the page, you forget that you're looking at a book that's set on top of a stack of six drafts that's had three sets of editorial eyes on it, right? Mm -hmm. but to get magic on a page, um, you know, it's not gonna necessarily be there all the way through the first draft. And you kind of, you have this feeling of falling short the I suck stage of writing um, that I think a lot of beginners go through because they get into it because they have taste mm -hmm. and they want that magic. And the more taste you have, uh, the more you feel like, oh, this isn't quite working, but that's, you know, that's, that's again, sort of a lie that your brain is telling you. Because you're looking at, you're comparing, you're comparing the bottom of one pile to the top of another, which is not fair to your own writing. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have, you said agent mm -hmm. once. It, 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 do, you, do you have your agent look it over before your editor or do you have your yeah, editor? Yeah, my do agent does do that. Uh, not everybody's agent does do that. So, and not everybody has an agent. Um but yeah, my agent is kind of hands-on with that stuff. Uh, at Before the very least, um, we will go, we will spend some time mashing the book together to sort of figure out like that cover letter on top of the book that tells editors what's it, what it is about. That's a very high stakes letter and it's hard to write on your own. <laughs> so my agent and I spend some time like mashing up, like what is this really about? So when I say very confidently that Simon sort of says is a book about is a comedy about healing from trauma, 
uh, it's because my agent and I spent a lot of time going, what is this book about? <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and going along the lines of what you were just talking about before, what is the greatest lesson that you've learned thus far in your writing career? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, in terms of career, I think what I've learned is that um, I just won a Newbery. I feel so good about winning a Newbery. This is novel number six, okay? <laughs> the first five, um, so I live in Canada, and in Canada, I've done reasonably well. It's a very small market. Like it's significantly less than the size of like California all by itself. Um, but my books have done reasonably well here. In the United States, they've always been well-reviewed. Full stop. Like they were well-reviewed and they were launched onto the ocean of publishing with little paper lanterns and then they sunk beneath the waves. And um, what I've learned is there's just really no knowing. And it's not really entirely about the book. It's just sort of this confluence of events. Um, someone on Instagram said something like, winning a prize means something, but not winning a prize means nothing. Right? Mm -hmm. It's such a roll of the dice. And all you can do, to go with the roll of the dice metaphor, all you can do is write something that's good enough to come up to the games table and be part of the conversation and all your publisher can do is try to push it so that it makes it to the table and after that whether it's prizes or like the court of public opinion it's just it's completely outside your control and it's hard to remember that mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to remember that because you want you want books to find readers that's what they're for right? So you want mm -hmm. books to find readers and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And so that part is hard. Right. And yeah, the thing that I've learned is like, okay, I've done my job. I wrote the best book I possibly could. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I will certainly try to cheerlead it and, and talk to bookstores and go to school visits and go out to festivals and oh God, even be nice on social media, I guess. But, um, you know, my job is done. I wrote it already. Um, and after that, it's it belongs to the world and there's not a lot I can do. Mm -hmm. and does your does your publisher do a lot of uh, a lot of marketing? Oh, yeah. For for sure. So I think that's something that like people who are considering self-publishing, um, really need to like get a handle on is how much marketing and distribution and all that stuff is done at the back end by someone other than the author. Like you're in a bookstore, you know mm -hmm. that there are way more books in the world than end up in the bookstore. Mm -hmm. I think most people don't know that, but books are mm -hmm. sold. Well, let's see. You sell a book to an agent or you sell yourself to the agent. So that's one. And then the agent sells it to the editor. So that's two. And an editor usually has to sell it internally at the house to the publication boards. Like, I want to publish this. And they're like, I don't think that's going to make us any money. So that's three. And then once it's published, you know, the eight, the people at the bookstore, the or the people at the publishing house have to sell it to the schools or the libraries or the bookstores. And there's a big cutoff there. Mm -hmm. There are maybe for every book that ends up in the bookstore, there's somewhere between 10 and a hundred that don't. Um, you know, so that's five. And only then can it actually go out in five readers. So, you know, if, mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to, if you're going to go it alone, oh, I don't have the chutzpah to, I admire the people who do. I admire the people that have that kind of hustle, but don't forget about that cutoff. Oh, I don't know how they do it. That's so tricky. So yeah, that's my publisher's job. Uh, they do a lot of work on that front. Um, and I am very, very grateful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they do a lot of social media. Um, yeah, they do a publicity lot of publicity. And... Everything from like, like designing the cover and getting the blurbs. Um, 
you know, when I wrote this book, uh, Simon sort of says, I can check. I wrote to my editor and I'm like, I want to thank everybody who worked on this book. But I don't actually know who that all is because it's right. Disney Hyperion books. It's a big house. Could you send me a list of everybody who's worked on it and what they've done? And so I wrote the, I wrote a thank you list. And this is like the thank you list. It is three <laughs> solid pages long of people who worked on this book. And, you yeah. know, it's, oh, Book Baby is a, is a joint effort. Um, some of these people I worked really closely with personally. And some of them, like the design team that did the interior layout, I now know their names, but they did it. It's their art. Um, and they should be so proud because it's beautiful, you know, and I didn't do that, you know, uh, and the people who get it into the school markets are different than the people who get it into the bookstores and the people who, you know, there's just the people who run the social media are different than the people who get it into the market. There's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the thing. I mean, you have to you have to remember that there's so many people that work on a book you know there, there's the people who who do the lettering you know the the fonts mm -hmm. and everything else and who, who design who design how it the layout of everything and it, mm -hmm. it's it's yeah there's just an amazing amount of people that do that stuff yeah there truly truly are and then there are people who are like we'd like to make an audio book out of this um this is this book is up for an Audi right now Yay! Oh, yay. Uh, I'm very excited about that because I feel like I can cheer on the, the audiobook narrator I had nothing to do with that all I did was write a script I guess write some words and he did just this magical incarnation of the book and you know so it's him and the people who picked him and all the sound engineers and that whole distribution channel and yeah, it's just, it's it's boggling to me, the people who attempt to do this by themselves. I could never. I um, It's like the people who are attempting a solo trek up a mountain without a support system. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, you know, they're, it's two very different paths. Did, did you write a separate script for an audio? Oh, no, no, no. He just read it. He just. Oh, he just, just read the book. book. Okay. He just read the book. Yeah. Oh, wow. That must have been fab fabulous. <laughs> yeah. I don't usually listen to my own audiobooks because it's somehow kind of mortifying to hear your own words read to you. Um, but I, uh, this one, they sent me the tape of the first chapter and he just made it so magical. Like, oh, that's just, <laughs> that's so perfect. It's so good. It's like watching a character come to life for a second time. Um so yeah, I'm thrilled about that. It's great. It, was it uh, was it an adult that read it? Yeah, so it's Will uh, Coyer, who does um, like he's a, a actor and performer in musical theater, and he does a lot of voiceover work in animation and a lot of audio books. And he's just he is fantastic. So. Um, they asked me what I wanted. I'm like, I think it should be male. I think it should be someone with kind of a, a light voice. Like, let's not get a baritone to my 12 year old. Um, and someone who can convincingly do. Like, they shouldn't sound like they're from any place other than Nebraska. Most people say Nebraskans don't have an accent, but we kind of do. <laughs> so. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, do you have any other piece of advice that you'd want to tell other writers? What I usually tell young people is go for it. <laughs> right? I mean, publishing is a ridiculous way to make a living. It truly, it's so hard. And, uh, and you know, so much of it is outside your control. Um, but writing is an amazing way to make a life. Oh, I love I, I that. Think, I oh. think people should, if they're artis artistic and if they're called to create things and specifically, you know, I can't really speak to anything but words. There's never going to be a perfect time to start. Like you shouldn't wait till you're retired or till you finish graduate school or like there's, there's never going to be a right time to start. 
uh, you're never going to have the skills or the time that you need. Um, so you might as well start now. Now is as not perfect as any, right? And you might as well do it. I mean, you might as, there's no substitute for actually making something out of nothing. There will never, if you're called to do that, I think you will make yourself miserable if you don't do that. So go do it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a don't quit your day job thing. I have a day job. Just, you know, keep, uh, it, it doesn't always pay the bills and there's a lot, you put a lot of pressure on your own creativity if you ask it to pay the bills, but yeah, this is great. I think go for it. Go for it is my best piece of advice. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Are there any groups, clubs, or organizations that you'd recommend to other writers that might have helped you in your career? Oh, absolutely. Um, so the landscape has changed so much since I published my first book that the things that helped me once upon a time um, have shifted slash don't exist. Um, but I have a small group of local writers who we actually meet in person. They've been invaluable. Um, through social media, I've connected with, with some other authors who, um, like, I really like their stuff and they really like my stuff. And so we cheer each other on and, and trade war stories and occasionally manuscripts. Um, but even if it's just cheering yourself, cheering each other on, that's great. To have other writers around you is a wonderful thing. And so there are professional organizations that do that. For children's authors, there's SCBWI, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, I think. Yep. Um, uh, they have local chapters and they're really good. Um, and there's one of those in many genres. Um, there's Romance Writers of America. There's a science fiction one. Um, those are definitely worth joining because what you really need is other writers around you too like no one else is going to understand when you like come in from your work day and go I killed someone and someone needs to say that's great <laughs> right you need some other writers around you because otherwise you're going to get arrested <laughs> absolutely <laughs> oh, yeah find some um the universities often have an extension office um, I volunteered as a poet for my um, for a literary magazine here in town. Um, I helped with events. I read their uh, submission piles and helped choose things for the magazine for 10 years. Uh, and I'm still sort of slightly involved with them. Um, there's probably a community arts festival wherever you are. Um, connecting with people in person is great, but the online stuff will find like your exact peers. You know, the other science fiction writers or the other romance writers or the other kids book writers. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. okay, now I have questions about you as a person. What is, oh, okay. one, what is one thing that most people don't realize about you? Mm. I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty boring, to be honest. I sit in my shed. I talk to fictional people. I do some gardening. I like to cook. Um, oh, so I, sometimes my age comes up and people go, you're not, I'm 51. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I'm like, why wouldn't I be? I don't, I don't understand why I wouldn't be. I've been through, you know, um, so I, I think people maybe don't, don't realize that because I'm six books in and usually when you're six books in, you're 35, <laughs> uh, but you know i'm slow okay well that's a good that's a good one okay and my next question you just sort of answered is what what is or are your passions when you're not writing um so writing is far and away the most interesting thing about me um but i'm interested in a lot of different things i you know i'm sitting here in my garden shed you probably can't tell it's a shed because i have it all finished and insulated but it's it's also very small if you can see it um so i'm looking out at my garden here at the end of winter going man there's a lot of cut back and clean up and stuff that i need to do and then the daffodils so gardening is is high on the list <laughs> um, 
I really like to spend time in my garden. Um, I'm really, I, I have creatures. I have uh, two cats and a dog. And if I could fill the house with more creatures, I totally would. Um, I have, I'm struggling with my health right now. I, I had COVID last January and uh, this is again, something you can't see about me, but this is my wheelchair. Yay. Um, so, but I used to um, do a lot of running and kickboxing and stuff. And I'm hoping someday to um, get back that to that or to find another way to be physical. That's, um, doesn't involve standing up and sitting down too much because of a blood pressure thing. Um, so I used to be really passionate about, mm -hmm. I learned to turn a, a handstand for my 50th birthday. I really wanted to do it. Oh. It was really hard and I really nailed it. So yay. Hey. <laughs> yeah. And then I do a lot of sort of community activism things. I'm, my social media is pretty bland. I'm not politically active in public, but I'm the person at the school board for the city council planning meeting for the um, local queer rights march or something like that. Yeah. Mm, okay. I'm very political on a on a local level. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, we got a and... book on band here. Yay! Really? Yeah, we got we got the Catholic public. We have a fully federally funded Catholic school district in Canada don't ask you can blame the French um and there were shadow but there were bands of our reading list books like for the children's choice prize some mm -hmm. of them weren't shelved because you know they have queer characters in them and I'm like mm -hmm. I'm going to fix that and I didn't do it I was a tiny tiny part of it but I did make myself uh -huh. obnoxious letters to the editor and showing up at school board meetings and things <laughs> So oh no! Possible. It's reaching Canada. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's possible to fight it, and I think yeah. I think authors have. Well, we have a unique point of view, and we should probably show up and share it. Um, but I also don't want to place all of that burden on authors of color, or you know, our indigenous authors, or you know people who are more publicly queer than I am because my, you know, um, you know, they shouldn't have to shoulder that by themselves. So those of us who, who aren't should maybe go and yell. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, <laughs> that's okay. Mm -hmm. So this, this is your, uh, your writing space. Uh, this is my writing space. Yeah. And Before the uh, pandemic, it was offline. Uh, oh, with really? Yes. But we ran uh, an internet cable out here so I could do my day job because we were closed for two years. Um, uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, what do you have to have with you uh, when you're writing or editing? Um, do you have to have food or drink? Um, I, I. I am a coffee person, so I generally do have a cup of coffee in the morning and another one right about now, right after we talk, Selena, just so you know, my eyes start to slowly droop. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can be pretty precious about it. Like my hubby, he just kind of dumps his stuff. Like when our kids were little and we had one table in the house, he could like pop his laptop onto the table and there's a stack of laundry here and there's a toddler doing macaroni art and he's like okay I'll just write the climax <laughs> I don't know how he does that I am very precious I need um I need a lot of time to get into my world and I need some time to get out of it so I need big blocks of uninterrupted scheduled time um I I really have trouble sneaking in five minutes here and there um yeah. So I have a dedicated space, which is a luxury for me. But before I had that, I had a favorite table at the library. <laughs> um, now, you do, do you need to have um, music or do you like silence? And if music, what type? I do have music. I have a different, uh, different music for each project. 
And usually I can't super get rolling on a project until I have the music for it. And then I just play it until everyone is so sick of it, they could just throw it out the window. Um, and it tends to be, um, I don't like music with lyrics because on X days when nothing is going right, I find myself transcribing lyrics, which is, you know, not good. Um, so I listen to a lot of various kinds of folk um, music instrumentals, classical music, classical music from different parts of the world, um, and some movie soundtracks. Um, Simon sort of says, I listen to the soundtrack from the movie Nebraska a lot. <laughs> and um, there's an album called, there's a Bruce Coburn album called Speechless, which is Bruce Coburn playing his own music um but like on acoustic instruments without lyrics and i listen to that so much that i think you know my <laughs> the children rebel but tough you know <laughs> so yeah i need i need music um and it just something to kind of set the tone it's a little cue for the brain right so like my brain needs a lot of coaxing i have um I have a beeswax candle, I have a cup of coffee, in the afternoon I have a cup of tea, and it's always the same kind of tea for each project. And then I switch, you know, so this is an Earl Grey Vanilla book, uh, but my last book had like a, you know, marigold petals in it. Um, I have, you know, this space, I have various things on my desk that I fiddle with, I have strong feelings about fountain pen and paper and, <laughs> books and yeah, I'm, I'm that person. I'm like the person who's like, okay, this is, this is my lucky Lammy Safari fountain pen with which I shall write my next novel. You know, and this is my daily journal in which I shall write my next novel, you know? Um, yeah. So I have a lot of, I have a lot of props. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a lot of, I have a lot of uh, a lot of cues for my brain that I use, and you know, some people need it, some people don't, um, and it's it's rather precious. I wish I were a little bit lower maintenance, but um, this is what my brain needs. Mm -hmm. to, okay. To be and you you had mentioned that you have critters, um, critters. <laughs> and I know that you're in a a room outside where the critters aren't. I but, know it's sad, but I yeah. have a cat that um, you know, thinks he's the laptop. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to get um significant uh typing done. So um I have a cat called Cygnus the emotional support cat. If anyone wants to like hashtag Cygnus the emotional support cat on social media, they will see pictures of him and his life advice. Uh Cygnus, like the constellation CYG in US. Um, he's after the first identified black hole, he's a tuxy cat with just little white sprinkles on him. And he used to be a feral cat. And now he's like, hey, you know what's better than living under the tractor shed? All of this. This is better. <laughs> This is better, but he has no manners, right? Because he's he's an ex-feral. So like he doesn't like to sit on your lap if he could sit on your boobs instead. And you know. You Typical know. male cat, right? <laughs> very, very in your face. Very, very in your face. But he's a sweetheart. And I've got Agate still, the little scrap who's in charge. She's a tiny little undersized tabby and she runs the house. She's she's important. And then I have a giant golden doodle just like much bigger than they're supposed to get whose name is luna who's just she's put all of her top like if she were a D, D character she'd put all of her stats into love and charisma and none of them into like brain and problem solving she's just kind of like hey guys <laughs> you throw luna a ball and she doesn't see where it lands she just keeps scanning the sky for it and i appreciate that about her she has endless hope <laughs> Okay. Now I have two more questions for you. Okay. Where can people find your work aside from Annie's bookstop of Worcester? And okay. I have to plug Annie's and you can, you can get Erin's book 
at Annie's if you call us at 508-796-5613, or you can email us at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. And where else can people find your books? And I promised that I would send book plates to Annie's. So you'll yes. have semi signed stock. That'll be fun. Um, oh, if people could support their indie bookstores, that would be fantastic. Um, as authors not interested in having um, billionaires dominate uh, our literary conversation, that would be great. But they are, you know, it's published, the they're published by major houses. Um, and that means you can get them at Barnes and Noble or on Amazon or, um, I mean, you can order them from Walmart if you'd like. They, uh, they, they make the rounds. They, um, they're, they're around. Uh, folks in Canada, I, um, my local indie is Wordsworth Books in Waterloo, and they pretty much always have signed stock because I'm in and out of there. So, if you're looking for for that and you're out of shipping reach of Annie's. That's my little plug. Thank you. All right. And my last question, how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? <gasps> That's so nice of you. Um, so my social media resolution this year is to not care about social media very much <laughs> <laughs> because I'm maxed out with the rest of my life. Okay. And I didn't sign up to be an online presence or influencer, but nevertheless, I am on social media. Um, so I'm Erin Bow Books. So it's E-R-I-N-B-O-W Books on every platform is my handle. Um, I'm trying not to be on Twitter too much, but I am over on Blue Sky. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Tumblr. I have a Facebook page. And I also have a website at erinbow.com. So, but yeah, I'm genuinely apart from the fact that I write books kind of a boring person like I think today on Instagram there's a photograph of a, my beet salad but <laughs> <laughs> you can at least meet Cygnus mm -hmm. well thank you so much Erin oh, it's, um, it's been to great talk to you Selena. it's been thank great you. talking to you mm -hmm. and thanks very much for for being on our uh, on our ship absolutely thank you guys Erin Bow. Thank you.